I'm not sure if I've ever done this in a sermon before, so I thought I would try something new and tell you about my kids. <laughs> when my oldest daughter was just a baby, she was probably between the ages of three months and 12 months, she would do something that none of my other kids have done. She would go to sleep at night or lay down for a nap and she would awaken herself with a song in her heart. It would be completely quiet in the house. You know, the kind of quiet that only happens when all the kids are asleep. And Lauren and I would hear the sweet sounds of her little coos as she sang herself from her dream world into becoming awake. It was one of the most memorable and beautiful parts of her infancy, and actually, We've had two other kids, neither of whom woke up in this way. They woke up more like the standard kid would wake up, which is they would scream and cry and need somebody almost immediately to be there. But Lucy, for whatever reason, when she awoke in the mornings or from a nap, she would wake with a song in her heart. And so I'd walk into her room, and I'd scoop her out of her crib, and I would find these words coming out of my mouth, words that actually my mom used to say to me when I was a kid. You know how when you get older, your parents' words start coming out of your mouth? Yep. So I'd pull her out of the crib, and I'd tuck her in my arms, and I'd say, aren't you all bright-eyed and? Oh, thank heavens. I was worried that was just a family thing for me, but... <laughs> That's what my mom used to say to me, and so that's what I would say to my daughter. And candidly, I have no idea what it means to be bushy-tailed, but I do know this. I know exactly what it is to be bright-eyed. That's the phrase that we use to put expression to the reality of the sheer joy that wiggles through a baby's body in their laughter and beams from their eyes. The eyes, even of a baby who can't say anything, have an incredible ability to communicate the deep inner realities of our lives. The eyes unveil for us the deep thoughts and feelings and attitudes of our very souls. And it's not just joy either. When our wheels first squeaked across the pavement here in southwest Florida, my son David was just on the hip. And many of you are so wonderfully warm and nurturing that when my wife would walk through the narthex just behind the sanctuary, she would be greeted by all of you and somebody would greet David and David would do this. He would turn into his mom and he'd look out and glance a glare at whoever was around and you could tell exactly by his furrowed brow what was on his mind and it was concern. The eyes reveal not only joy that beams from the inside, or concern by the furrowed brow on the outside, but they reveal the deep inner realities of our lives. And perhaps in 2020, more than any other year, we got used to looking to the eyes to understand what was going on with people. Because when a part of our faces were obscured, we would look to the eyes to determine what was going on with that person. I was at a meeting a couple of weeks ago with another pastor, and she used the word smized. Have you heard this word? It's the expression we use to put to smiling with our eyes. The eyes, it's been said, are the very window to the soul. You can tell a lot about what's going on with somebody by their eyes. And that's not true just when they're young babies. It's true throughout all of our years. And it's not just what beams from behind the eyes or the furrowed brow that communicates concern. It's also, actually doctors and scientists have been studying how the eyes, by the dilation of their pupils, can reveal to us, they can correlate, our happiness or contentment. And it's not just that that you can correlate with the dilation of the eyes. You can also correlate a fight or flight response. You know what that is? When extreme stimulus comes up and we need to make an emergency decision whether we're going to run or we're going to fight, the eyes dilate, letting in more information so we can make a rapid decision. The eyes are the window to the soul. And they actually communicate in another way as well. What captures our gaze tells us a lot about what's on our hearts as well. You ever 
looked at somebody who was looking at somebody else and been able to tell by their gaze exactly what they were thinking. It's that young man that was courting your daughter many years ago. And everybody could look at him, and by the way in which he looked at her, everybody could tell that he was smitten with her, perhaps except for her. The eyes are the window to the soul. They communicate the very deep inner realities of our lives, and what captures our gaze is exactly as important as what's inside or beaming from our eyes. The eyes are the window to the soul. So what captures your gaze? I want to think about that for a little while today. Because we're going to be looking at one of the greatest and truest love stories that the world has ever known. The incredible love of God expressed in his son Jesus Christ in his unwavering, unflinching gaze upon humanity. But to do so, we actually have to start where our passage starts. And our passage starts with another reality that if we're going to be honest, we'd rather not look at. If we had our druthers, we'd never gaze upon this part of our lives. We don't like to think about or talk about or especially be talked to about the reality of sin. And yet it's a topic that we need to address because the world has a sin problem. We don't want to talk about the problem of sin because perhaps we've had a negative experience with somebody who was talking to us about sin. And because of that negative experience, we felt judged or condemned, and therefore we just would rather not look on that part of our lives. This is actually the experience that I had. When I was in college, I was walking across the quad one spring afternoon, and I happened upon the middle of the quad, you know, that center part of the quad where all of the all of the sidewalks spiderweb out from there, and right in the middle of the quad was a young man standing on a crate with a bullhorn in his hand, and he was bludgeoning the people who were gathering around with the reality of their sin. And I don't recall a single thing that he said, but I recall the look in his eye, his furrowed brow, and as he lobbed verbal grenades at the crowd, I watched them as they put their shields up to defend themselves, And I wondered candidly what sort of good this tactic was doing in the world. So when I think about the topic of sin, and I think about talking to you all about sin, that's the idea I have in my mind, and I'd rather honestly look away. Or maybe you've had a similar experience to that, or maybe you've had a slightly different experience. Maybe just the topic or the word sin conjures up these memories of that thing that happened a long time ago, or maybe that long, not that long ago, something that you did or something that was done to you, and just the mere conjuring of that mental image in your mind stirs up deep emotions within you that, honestly, you'd rather stuff than look at them. For this reason, most of us don't want to look at the topic of sin. But we need to. And here's why we need to. Because sin leaves a wound in our lives. And wounds need to be treated with the appropriate treatment. If you just leave a wound without the right treatment, it could fester and it could become infected. And so I sort of envision this meditation not as judging you or shaming you, but rather that this meditation would be like an ointment for that wound that has been festering for so long that needs to be healed by God this morning. So what captures your gaze? To look at this topic of sin, we're going to be looking at one of the most beautiful passages in all the scriptures, one of the greatest summaries of the gospel message for us in Jesus Christ from the Gospel of John, chapter 3. But to understand it, because we're going to kind of parachute into the middle of it, we actually need to We need to understand the context in which it came. So let me unpack it for you just a little bit. You know, the Bible uses an interesting word, phrase, that's sort of a word picture, really, for the idea of sin. The Bible uses the phrase in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, saying, sin is crouching at your door, and it desires to have you. Sin is crouching at your door. The word picture behind that is sort of like an animal that is crouched down and ready to pounce. Or maybe 
or maybe like a, a snake that is coiled up and ready to strike. We have those kind of snakes here in Southwest Florida, don't we? They don't exactly look like this snake that's on the screen, but nonetheless, we have those kind of snakes. A couple of years ago, I was watching a, a viral video that went on the internet. It was a young man who was hiking in Florida, presumably somewhere around the Everglades, and the young man got tired, and so he sat down next to a tree. Unbeknownst to him, there was a coiled up diamondback rattlesnake sitting right there as well. And when he sat down, that tail started wagging, and quickly the tone of the entire video changed. Now, candidly, I have no idea what you're supposed to do in circumstances like this, but I'll tell you what, I learned exactly what I don't want to do by watching this video. The man from my vantage point appeared to do everything wrong. At one point, he provoked the snake so much that it lunged toward his face and stopped just short. And the two of them were staring eyeball to eyeball for like seven seconds. And if the eyes are the window to the soul, his eyes were revealing sheer terror. And then I kid you not, this is what he said. I'm gonna take this stick and I'm gonna poke it. To which I audibly said, no! Now, luckily for him, everything ended well. He poked the snake, it slithered away. I don't advise that if you're walking near the Everglades, but nonetheless, it worked for him. And that's the word image for sin in the scriptures. Sin is like that coiled up rattlesnake that desires to have you. And when it strikes, it leaves its venom in our veins. And we see the problems of sin in the world. A wise pastor once said that the only empirically verifiable doctrine in all the scriptures is the doctrine of sin. Because sin is like a poison that is coursing through the veins of the world and it shows up as much as we think we're progressing as humankind, it shows up in countless ways. It's that thing that keeps rearing its ugly head. It's anger and violence. It's war. It's human trafficking. It's all the things that cause problems in the world. And it's coursing through our veins. And just like a snake bite, you can't treat it by putting a band-aid over it. Rather, we need anti-venom or an antidote for it. And our Bible passage has it. And as we parachute into the middle of this chapter 3 of the Gospel of John, Jesus has already been having a conversation with a man whose name was Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a religious leader in the ancient world. And he had come to Jesus to sort of learn what Jesus' teaching was all about. And in the process of trying to explain to this man what it meant to be a follower of his, he referred to a story that Nicodemus would know very well. The story was one of the central stories for the people of God, the nation of Israel, who had been freed from slavery to Egypt to be free for worshiping God out in the wilderness. And every time they were out in the wilderness, despite having seen miracle after miracle, the people of God, instead of turning to the Lord in trust, diverted their gaze a different direction. And so every time their bellies would grumble, rather poetically, they would grumble against Moses and against God. So Jesus refers in this passage to Nicodemus to the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verse 5 when it said that the Israelites spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Despite having been provided for by God in miraculous ways, when their bellies grumbled, they turned not to the Lord in trust, but they turned away from God. And so God sent consequences to them in the form of serpents. These serpents slithered into their camp and they bet, bit several of the Israelites who subsequently died. Because if sin is crouching at our door, when we open the door to sin, sin holds the door for death. That's throughout the biblical narrative. 
So the people of God, seeing the serpents in their camp, went to Moses and said, Moses, you got to go to God and tell him, get rid of these serpents. And God doesn't remove the serpents. Rather, God gets to the real heart of the issue, which wasn't the serpents, but their lack of trust in God. God tells Moses, make a bronze serpent, put it up on a pole, and lift it up to the people that when they look at that serpent with the eyes of faith that they might be healed. Okay, this is what Nicodemus knew, and this is where our passage begins. This is the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. Hear now the word of the Lord. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the life, hates the light, and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. So our passage begins with this fairly simple comparison. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so that when the people would look to that serpent, they would be healed and live, God lifted up Jesus, the Son of Man, upon a cross, that whoever would look at him would not perish, but live now and forevermore. Relatively straightforward comparison. This is the season of Lent. The season of Lent is a time of the year where we spend 40 days, 40 days which symbolically represent the 40 years that the Israelites wandered in the wilderness. And it's a time period when we, like the Israelites, are invited to look upon the reality of our human sin and understand what God has done for us in Jesus Christ through his crucifixion and his resurrection. Lent is a season that forces us to come face to face with the reality of sin. I sort of imagine those Israelites. Imagine that you were wandering around in the wilderness and you had been bitten by a serpent. What would be the last thing you'd want to look at if you'd been bit by a serpent? The last thing you'd want to look at would be another snake. What God was encouraging the Israelites to do was to look at the reality of the consequences of their sin. That sin had been crouching like a coiled up snake at their door, that they had opened the door, and that the sin held the door for death. And so too, you and I are invited to look at that which we would rather not gaze upon for all the reasons we've already outlined. We'd rather not look at the reality of our sins or the consequences that our sins led to, namely that grisly and gruesome scene of the Son of God crucified on a cross. You know, most Protestant churches, when you see a cross in the sanctuary, what is notably missing is Jesus from the cross. That's for good reason, because Jesus died once and for all for the forgiveness of sins. He's no longer on the cross, but sits at the right hand of God, and yet, during Lent, It all culminates on Good Friday when we're invited to look at the reality of our human sin and the consequences therein and to trust in the good news of God revealed just after this in the passage. The good news is that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And our passage ends with this reality that if we bring our sin into the light, 
and allow God to redeem it, that we will have light. Because guess what? God has seen all of our sins anyway. The scriptures tell us that there is nothing that has missed the gaze of God. There's no sin that we've ever done that has been hidden in the darkness. There's no stray thought of our mind that the Lord hasn't seen. There is no muttering underneath our breath that God hasn't heard. God's eyes have been on all those things. It's like it says in the book of Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah says that God says, for my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from my face, nor is their wrongdoing concealed from my eyes. God has looked upon the totality of human sin. And here's the unbelievably good news. If the eyes are the window to the soul, despite the fact that God has seen every sin that has been committed past, present, or future, the reality is that God still loves the world so much that he gave his only son. If you could imagine the gaze of our Heavenly Father, you would see a look of love like we've never seen before. A look of love that accepts us for who we are and the mistakes that we've made and loves us anyway so much that there's no length that God wouldn't go to in order to deliver us from our sin. And just like a snake bite won't heal by putting a Band-Aid over it, our sin infection won't heal either, and so God gave us the antidote that if we would look to Jesus through the eyes of faith, we might be saved. So what has captured your gaze? There's another Israelite person in the Old Testament who was in the wilderness, sort of on run for his life, and he found himself in a cave. And he, in that moment, had a decision to make. Was he going to look to trust in the Lord, or was he going to do what all the Israelites seemed to do before him and look away from God and grumble against God? In the midst of that cave, he pens a song upon his heart, a song that goes, Awake, my soul. Place your trust in the Lord. Awake, my soul. It's like he's trying to stir from his dream life into reality the, the goodness of God in order to place his trust in that. And I couldn't help by, but think about my daughter who would wake herself up with a song. Think about her perspective for a moment. Imagine being a three-month to a 12-month-old lying in a dark room, seemingly all alone, to sing a song of joy in that moment is a sign of trust that her dad's not too far away and that just by singing a song of awake my soul that door would open and the light would come flooding in and I would come in and take her in my arms when we awake our souls to the reality of our own sinfulness it can feel dark and lonely and yet when we look to the cross with eyes of trust and faith, Jesus opens the door and lets the light pour in. If sin held the door for death, Jesus holds the door for life to follow. And he wraps his loving arms around us. And here's the great hope. That one day, when our heads ultimately hit the pillow, never to awake again, that there'll be a song on our hearts that'll awaken us into a room that is not dark, but rather the scriptures tell us that what heaven is like is that God is the light therein. And we will awake with a song of joy on our hearts as we sing of the goodness of God and are taken into his loving arms now and forevermore. So we have a decision to make. Where is our gaze going to be? Are we going to avoid looking at the part of our lives that came up in our mind just as the topic of sin was brought up? Or are we going to expose them to God's light, trusting that he who gave his only son for us loved us enough to make a way for us to be with him forever? Are you going to turn away or are you going to lift your eyes 
upon the cross of Jesus Christ and find the very antidote for your soul. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we give you thanks and praise for your great love for us. It is unfathomable, but Lord, you love us more than we can imagine. And you gave your only son that we might be in relationship to you. What a mystery it is that we should be healed by his wounds and that you'd take the wounds that we have and put them upon him. We ask, Lord, that you would indeed take that part of us that has been on our heart and mind and bring it before you. Help us, Lord, to see into your soul because of your great and unwavering gaze upon humanity, your great and everlasting love for us. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Thank you.